Is critical race theory and anti-racism merely an analytical tool or a much more dangerous ideology that we need to resist? We'll discuss that today. So I was going down the YouTube rabbit hole the other day, just watching different videos, and I stumbled upon Sean McDowell speaking to Samuel Say, and they were talking about critical race theory. And I started looking at some of the comment sections as people were, were live commenting in on, on the show, and I saw somebody that I was familiar with, a guy named Ruslan. Now, Ruslan is a Christian entertainer, he's a rapper, and he's a podcaster. He talks about kind of like tabloidy stuff in the culture, um, and then just kind of pop culture in general. Uh, so I saw him live tweeting, and this is what he said in one of the comments, and I thought it particularly striking, so I wanted to mention it. And so he said this, we, speaking of Christians, don't accept any discipline fully, not psychology, not sociology, not the Enneagram, LOL. <laughs> uh, so why is CRT, critical race theory, being dismissed by some Christians and elevated to corrupt a worldview that's tainting the church? Now, grammar aside, because it's just the comment section, so we can push that aside, um, He's suggesting that critical race theory is similar to sociology or psychology. Well, he raps and he reads the Bible, so I guess these days that's enough. N now, I say that jokingly a little bit, but, but really to make an important but broad observation. We are very tempted today to listen to people with a big following as some type of authority, and we need to be very clear here. Cultural power should never be mistaken for credibility. Just because you have a bunch of followers does not mean you know what you're talking about. And here, Ruslan is making a serious logical fallacy. He's practicing something called false equivalence. Now, what is false equivalence? Well, simply, it means that he is oversimplifying complex subjects so that he can draw a connection between those two things. It would be like saying, my dad has a mustache, Stalin has a mustache, so therefore my dad is Stalin. Something akin to that. Now, that's a little bit of a joke, but, but seriously, oversimplification is a serious issue, especially when we're talking about something like critical race theory. So Einstein said this, everything should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. Now, I find we do this a lot in Christianity, maybe for the sake of ease, but we make many mistakes when we oversimplify things. For instance, some would say, Reed, why are you critiquing a fellow Christian? You're dividing the church. Actually, critiquing is very healthy, and it's something that should be practiced. And that seems more like a fear tactic to try to keep discussion at a bare minimum. So if we're going to really look at critical race theory and give it the attention it demands, we must analyze it in two ways, upon its basis and upon its implication. So first of all, its basis. What is the foundation of critical race theory? What is its basic operating principle? And is it something that we should operate in? So critical race theory is based upon racial essentialism in general, believing that social identities such as ethnicity, nationality, or gender are the necessary characteristics of people which define who they are. Now, that's pretty bold right there. So rather than define people based upon objective moral standards, we judge people based upon their race, which, wait for it, is racist. This ontologically superficial ideology creates things like this. Segregated graduations at Columbia University. When I saw that, I couldn't even believe it. I mean, it's like we've gone full circle back to Jim Crow and celebrating that. And then things like microaggressions. That's simply the idea that you can discern the intents and the thoughts of people's hearts absent any objective evidence. And you have the special capability to sniff out covert racism and white supremacy wherever it's lurking. Well, it also does things like creates, creates false narratives surrounding police racism. So this summer it did that with an agenda absence of real empirical data to back up the claim. And if you don't think claims that don't have any empirical data to really back up the claim is uh, dangerous, then I want to introduce you to my friend 2020. Okay, so let's talk about the implications. Where does critical race theory leave us? So here's the, big, the biggest problem with critical race theory, and Christians need to pay special attention to this. First of all, it robs us of personal agency by treating people in a group rather than treating them as individuals. So I'm just going to level with you right now, and, and I don't want you to misunderstand me, but race is a folk taxonomy, and a folk taxonomy is a vernacular naming system, and it can be contrasted with scientific taxonomy. So in other words, race itself is not real. It's a social construct. So to be sure, racism exists. 
But to say a white person is this and a black person is this is utterly false. Sorry, Mr. President. What you all know, but most people don't know, unlike the African-American community, with notable exceptions, the Latino community is an incredibly diverse community with incredibly different attitudes about different things. For Christians, this is dangerous and heretical since we believe that the scripture is true. And Paul said this, that we should no longer judge anybody by the outward. We used to do that with Jesus, but we do it no more. How should we judge people then? How should we discern who a person is? Well, the way God does. And in 1 Samuel 16, it says this, that God does not look on the outward as man does, but he looks on the heart. It reminds me of a man who once said that, I dream of a day where we will look at people based upon the conduct of their character rather than the color of their skin. We need to remember those words today. So here's the other part of that. The implication of critical race theory is that not only it it treats people based upon their group identity, but within that, it elevates people's group experience. Now, this is something that's truly postmodern. And the problem with elevating people's experience as a form of reality is that it discounts the fact that there is an objective truth far above what they experience, that there is an objective moral standard. And as Christians, we believe that the Scripture is that. We believe that the Scripture is true no matter how you feel or what you've experienced in the past. The Scripture is true regardless of what you think about it. (laughs) You know, your opinion's important. Everybody's got one, though, right? And God's opinion matters more. So it elevates subjective experience above objective reality. That's how come you can hear supposedly educated news media personalities say things like, my truth. Like, I've got to tell you something. There is no such thing as your truth. There is the truth and there are the lies. But there is no your truth. We cannot make up a truth based upon our personal experience because somebody could have experienced something totally different. And if it's contradictory, guess what? You can both be wrong, but you can't both be right. And so we as Christians believe that there is much a much higher moral authority, a much higher objective standard that we should believe in and hold our life to. And quite frankly, part of the polarization and the division that's happening in our nation right now is because critical race theory is a disservice, certainly to people of color, but all people. So if it is anti-truth, then it is anti-gospel, and we should resist it. You can catch brand new episodes of Indie Thinker with Reed Huberman every Monday and weekly bonus episodes to keep you thinking throughout the week. But you have to subscribe and click the bell to be notified when new episodes drop. If you enjoy this content, make sure to like this video and share it with friends.